collaboration. Anyone? Can I hear anyone? Oh, hold on. I need to unmute people. Okay. Uh, unmute. I'm unmuting Ivan. I'm unmuting Khan, VB. Okay. I think I am muting David, the one guy I know. Hold on. It looks like we can mute ourselves. I think. Sorry. Hey, uh, okay. So, yeah, I'm new to this. This is, but I wonder why my video is not showing. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. All right. Whoever's here, <laughs> let's talk. I'm open. Hello? Who's here? Who's not muted? Who's here? I'm here. Hello? Yeah. Who's this? It's Khan. Ivan? Hello? No, no, not me. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see Khan. Okay. Uh, okay. I guess people mute and unmute themselves. Okay, this is my first attempt at this. So my idea was, if this works, I will do more in the future. But I thought this would be like, uh, you know, an attempt. So any suggestions, comments, whatever, I'm open. Someone say something, ask a question, speak up. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I was reading through the citations of one of your articles, how we come to own ourselves. And in the citations, there was an English translation of one of Harper's writings, uh, I think it's called Property, Anarchy and the State. Uh, it said it was an informal translation. I wanted to know where, if you had that translation and uh, I have a follow-up question if you do. Um. Well, we could talk uh, fairly informally here. Um, to be honest, this is a strange coincidence. I just talked to Hans Hoppe five minutes ago. We were talking on the phone. Uh, we, we're friends. We talk all the time. Um, I'm not sure which uh, which that which audio which uh, which uh, publication that is. Could you could you tell me more? Because I don't remember any kind of uh, anything about that. Um, it's it's in German. I, it's called. Uh, I can't really read it, but I can to anarchy and und Staat. Yeah. And it, it's uh, in your article how we come to our own ourselves. It says there was an informal English translation of it, but Correct. I couldn't find. I couldn't find it on the internet. If it is on the internet, so I I think. If if I remember what happened was um, Hans told me, yes, I thought of this before, but it's not been translated. And so I looked into it, and I think Guido Holzman or Hans, I can't remember which one at this point, helped me translate a few passages. Uh, but as far as I know, that particular piece is not in uh, translated from German uh, into English or other languages. Um, I would like okay. it to, but uh, all I have is the translations of a few passages that I got out of Guido Hilsman and, uh, and Hans uh, the The reason I ask this is because I'm currently trying to write something on uh, children rights and the in the in your article you talked about that a lot and i wanted to ask you if you still hold the belief that we have positive obligations for children that we need to satisfy or do um yeah my view has not changed i think that um if you uh, you know create a life that is arguably rights bearing, then yes, you have some op positive obligations to take care of that life. Just the normal, you know, conservative traditionalist view of, of living. Um, I don't think it's that controversial. Um, 
how you format why you have this obligation is uh, a libertarian thing. But yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I don't disagree that you have an obligation. The, the problem is saying you have an obligation doesn't mean too much because if you don't have a statist apparatus to enforce it, what does it really mean, right? I mean, if you have a 14-year-old child who's being abused and neglected, they're basically better off to run away and find a new life or a new home or a new set of parents or whatever than to try to sue their parents for support. Yeah, excuse me, sir. Uh, sure. Could you allow my friends to join? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying right now. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. Any questions, comments, discussions, anything? I mean, I'm open to anything. I'm just doing this as an experiment to see what, what might work in the future. Would I ask a question, uh, Mr. Kinsella? Sure. You can, can you hear me properly? I hear you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kinsella, um, I wanted to know, uh, I'm a lawyer uh, based in Paris. My name is Viraj Bide. And um, I know that you have worked a little bit on questions of international investment law and things like that. I think you also written a book which was published by Oxford of quite a quite a while, quite a while back. Is that uh, is that correct? Um, yes. Although the second edition just came out last month, so it's actually pretty recent, 2020. Okay. So I had a, just as a matter of discussion, I had a two part uh, brief questions. Both were very brief. The first was uh, more, more legal. The first question was, do you really think that, uh, that uh, an idea like states giving consent to, uh, to arbitration under all these, uh, I'm sorry, investors giving consent to arbitration under all these treaties uh, in the light of the current crisis could kind of put the state's feet to the fire and use that and you be used as a signaling mechanism even mm. to try and control the amount of madness that these states are going to do in the name of this crisis that was my first question and more generally do you think that um investment treaty arbitration even though we have always been against investment treaties in principle is that the lesser of two evils compared to not having anything as a protection for foreign investment these are my two questions thank you well why don't we just talk about it? Because um, I'm not sure that we're against investment treaties. I mean, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, I was looking at this. Uh, I was looking at a lot of articles on these to to uh, to try and see the kind of position that was taken. And for example, Rothbard was never a big fan of any any investment treaties because finally it was. I mean, he said that it was just finally special interests coming in and and getting what they wanted in those treaties. Mm. It was all the protectionism all over again, and it didn't really change anything. And so I think that the default position would be unilateral free trade, right? Okay, so if you have a reference to what you're talking about with Rothbard, I, please send it to me because I'd be interested in it. Okay, um, uh, let, let me just type it in the link. I mean, he had a very famous article on NAFTA, for example, which I can, which I can find for you. I'll type it in the, in the, in the chat. And we can post you off sometime. Right. And, and so now we get into the way some lawyers look at things. Um, I don't think of free trade as the same as I think of investment issues. Okay. Okay. So let me, let, let, let me explain. Um, Free trade just means that between 
regions or nations or states that they trade with each other um, with very low impediments to trade, basically low tariffs. Okay. So free trade has to do with nations trading with each other, services or goods. Okay. Okay. Investment agreements have to do more with citizens or investors of one country from another jurisdiction investing in and establishing a business unit and a factory or something like that in another country. Okay. And so that, that issue usually has to do with investment agreements, which are called bilateral investment treaties, BITs, or multilateral. Um, but they have to do with protecting property rights in the local regime. Okay. Okay. Free trade honestly has almost nothing to do, as far as I can see, with, with protecting property rights. Free trade just means how much of a tariff will you impose on okay. the flow of goods and services between borders, right? And then immigration is yet another issue of the free trade or the free flow, sorry, of human being bodies like be between – so you have free immigration issues. How much immigration can there be? You have free trade, which is just trade between people in different countries, and then you have foreign investment issues, and those are all distinct. Um, and people confuse these issues, and they usually confuse them um, because they don't understand the difference or because they want to push one policy over the other. And so, for example, um, intellectual property is a big, uh, big issue from the West and from the US, like Hollywood and the pharmaceutical companies. They want American style or Western style intellectual property pushed onto the other countries. Now, okay. how do they do that? How do you push it onto another country? Well, you could make it a condition of a agreement, right? And the agreement could be an international trade agreement, or it could be a immigration agreement, or it could be a all, all of these kinds of things. The you know the 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 monetary organizations, the U, the United Nations. Um, a human rights organizations. So, but the the bottom line is that there's a confusion because most people are very naive about these issues, and the people that are experts in them, and they're usually academic or governmental experts for what five, ten, fifteen years of their career. Um, okay. They understand the system very well, right? So they can manipulate it because most people don't understand what they're talking about. So, for example, they will say that, well, if – I mean Donald Trump does this uh, in an intuitive way. Like he says, well, China is ripping us off or stealing our IP. So therefore – so he uses that to manipulate the – the uh, the trade deals with them, right? But okay. if you understand the way that law works and property rights work and IP works, you'll see that um, intellectual property protection has almost nothing to do with free trade between countries, right? So okay. of course they use this they. They use it as an excuse. So like Donald Trump will say, well, we can impose tariffs on China and use that as a bargaining chip because they're stealing our IP. Okay. But IP theft, even if it's really theft, is a local issue. It's like a, a foreign investment 
issue. It's not a trade issue. It's a foreign investment issue. And that's an issue that every country agrees that every other country has the right to make a decision upon. Like the United States can decide which foreign country nationals can invest in the US. Europeans, French, Chinese, whatever. They can make a decision about who can invest in their country. Singapore, Hong Kong, whatever. So that's, an, that's a local investment issue, right? That's a property rights issue. Um, and so all these things are mingled together for political reasons. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think that um, – So if, if, we could, if we could really separate the investment aspect of these treaties and just have that, that would be perfectly legitimate uh, as long as nation states are still around. Well, so my view is a sense that it would be purely a protection of property on the international plane between nation states, and there is no, there is no, um, there is no fancy stuff that goes that goes beyond just the protection of property. Uh, well, that would be perfectly legitimate. Is that? I mean, uh, so so my my personal view is that um, by and large, by and large, over the last seventy years, the slow movement of the world trading system towards more trade of goods and services between nations has been a good thing, okay? Um, I don't, as a libertarian, I don't think it should have been managed, right? It shouldn't have been like, oh, we can have this much and there should be these conditions. But still, there's been a gradual movement towards free trade of services and goods. And there's also, at the same time, been a, a gradual movement towards um, opening of regimes towards foreign F – we call it FDI, foreign direct investment. Um, I think these are all good things, um, but I think they should not be conflated. Um, so it's in the interest of Western powers and developed nations and developing nations and the southern nations as we call them it's all in their interest to have open free trade right to, to basically lower tariffs mm -hmm. but it's also in their interest to lower barriers to foreign direct investment that is investment from outsiders who want to open factories or invest in their countries but the problem is that they always, almost always impose conditions upon this. Um, so for just for example, this well, that was recent- precisely my point, uh, That was precisely my point. Because they impose conditions, would we be better off without any of these investment treaties? Or is that still a lesser evil compared to having nothing and being at the mercy of the state in which you're investing? That that's a that's a that, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if I am competent to answer that. Um, my 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 intuition, my feeling is that um, over the last seventy years, basically, even though I'm opposed to managed trade and the way the government has done it, things have gradually opened up. And they've made the world more interconnected, and I think that's a good thing. Um, and in fact, this might be the only thing that prevents us from going into crazy times right now, right? Because we're so interdependent. I mean, you have the Americans saying that, oh, we're dependent upon Chinese supply chains for Apple products or whatever. And maybe a company would diversify or whatever, but on the other hand, it's good that we have this interconnection so that you know we don't want to nuke each other. We don't want to have war with each other. We, we know that that would result in chaos. No one is self-sufficient. No one is independent, and the division of labor and the specialization of labor has been spread, and I think that's been a roughly a good thing. But it's been accompanied by this idea that the government manages it, right? And so that's the big problem. Uh, the government manages it. And so at, at one hand, it makes us richer. 
On the other hand, it makes us more dependent upon the idea that the government has to be in control. So I can't, I can't say which one I think is predominant. What do you think? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I would probably leave the floor for other people to ask you questions. I just wanted to make a brief comment. We could very well have ended up with a very, very centralized international investment regime because we had things like the Havana Charter in the 1950s, which thankfully failed. So uh, I, I, mean, I personally think that the way it is right now in a very decentralized manner where different states decide for themselves and you have many variations of, of investment treaties, I think that's a good thing. I mean, it's still, it would have been better if the states didn't manage it, as you said, but it's better than a centralized management that we could have got under uh, things like the International Trade Organization and the, and the Havana Charter. But thank you for your answer, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, I uh, had a question for you. <clears throat> Go ahead. All right. Uh, can you hear me? I do. All right, cool. So uh, my question has to do with, um, uh, it's a, more of a theoretical question. It has to do with uh, you know, the foundations of Austrian economics and praxeology. <clears throat> now, I've known for a while that there's been a controversy within the Austrian school um, regarding the concept of time preference uh, and uh, how uh, you know, traditional pure time preference theory is uh, justified. <clears throat> uh, you know, recently I heard Bob Murphy talk uh, on the Tom Woods show about this, uh, and I went back and just went over his, um, <clears throat> his arguments wherever I could uh, find them on the internet. Uh, now, it appears to me that um, uh, the opposition to the idea of pure time preference stems from a misunderstanding, uh, not, not simply of the ideas of, you know, of goods and ends and means and things like that, but also possibly of the nature of time itself from a praxeological standpoint. So I just wanted to first ask you uh, whether you've kept up with this uh, debate within the Austrian school and what your view is. I mean, my hunch is that you probably uh, agree with the, um, the traditional view of uh, time preference, the pure time preference theory of interest, but I'd love to hear your take on this. Mm. Well, I, uh, sure. Um, I don't hold myself out as a, an expert on certain topics. Um, I follow this, and I have followed it. Um, the particular thing you're talking about uh, it sounds familiar, but I'm not sure if I, I'm up on it. If you want to update me more, I'm up to it. Um, I do have some thoughts on – to me, it's about the nature of the distinction between economic analysis, right? Fundamental primordial economic concepts and normative concepts, which people – and legal, which people conflate together. Um, and then so, – so then we get to this issue of scarcity and then time. And so to me, time is one of the most uh, – fascinating concepts that uh, affects all of this. Um, and I have a feeling there are people that have written on this in scattered ways that I, I'm not sufficiently familiar with that I could be. But on the other hand, I feel like everyone that writes on it disappoints me. So my view on time is that time is – Time is not – so I, I – like I would personally – and again, you asked me a question, so I'm answering. Time is not a fourth dimension in physics, okay? It's not another dimension. And in economics, it, I don't think time is a scarce resource. I just think time is a concept that we develop that – explains the flow of events, the fact that things happen after each other. In other words, the fact that there is causation or causality. Um, and so I don't think that time is a thing that exists in the way that the other resources exist that we categorize in economic terms and that we 
uh, protect by legal uh, regimes, right? Like scarce resources or property rights. So to me, time is just a concept we use to explain um, the flow, the, the succession of events. So I, I, I think that you're in danger of uh, the fallacy of reification, right? Where you like, you, you conceptualize something that helps you explain some phenomena, but then you think of it as a real existing physical thing. So I don't, but again, I'm not a physicist, I'm not an expert. I don't think time is a fourth dimensional thing that exists or a resource right. that you can own, if that's right, what that, you're asking. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the, I guess the, uh, what this turns on uh, is whether the concept of time preference is something that logically follows from the action axiom. Uh, uh, if I understand correctly, Bob Murphy denies this, and there are others. I mean, I think Guido Holzman mm. has also written on this. And uh, mm. what I've heard from Bob Murphy and what I understand of his view <clears throat> is that he says if there's such a thing as time preference, that is that people uh, prefer things sooner rather than later, why not construct uh, a concept of proximity preference and say that people prefer things mm. that are closer mm. to them rather mm. than things that are far away? Mm. You know, so That's, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll give you my my thoughts on it. Um, so, the fact of acting means that you act at a certain point in time, right? And so, you could say that it ineluctably demonstrates that you prefer the present over the future, but in a way that's unavoidable because some things have to be in the future, some are in the present. So I'm not sure if that's actually true. Like, um, it's like I think maybe if you read Hoppe's article like explaining why indifference analysis like is flawed, like you could like the whole Beridian's ass thing, but like the the mule that like is looking at a bale of hay on the left and the right, and everything's the same, and he doesn't choose, so that shows he's demonstrating indifference. Um, like Hoppe's argument is that like no, you can never demonstrate indifference. Um, I think maybe an extension of that argument, Hoppe's analysis of uh, of indifference analysis, could be applied to time preference theory because you could never you could you can only act for what is available at the present right um so interest rates and things like that arise from the fact that you defer your consumption based upon your vision of the future uh right in the in the way you the structure production and things like that but you can never really demonstrate that you're acting right now for something 10 years from now. I mean, it might happen, but you can, how can you demonstrate that in the current time? So I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just personally really skeptical of this whole idea of time. Like I had a, a I was just revisiting a, a lecture I had with uh, Jeff Tucker and uh, Stephen Molyneux and some other guys um, here in, in Texas about seven, eight, nine years ago. It's called Liberty on the Pines, and we were talking about, I mean, whether time is a scarce resource. And I made the comment that, well, time is scarce because as far as we know, we only have so much of it in our lives. So it's got aspects of scarcity, and Tucker said, Stefan, I thought you said that you don't think time is a scarce resource, and I said, well, you're right. I don't think it's a scarce resource per se. In other words, time is going to go on no matter what you do. It's just going to flow. It's a flow of events. I mean if you want to be scientific about it and be a, a physicist or a faux physicist, you could say, oh, it's a second law of thermodynamics or whatever, but really from a, from a human action, praxeological point of view, what we know is that we envision the future and we act now to try to make a causal change that will have an effect in the future. That's the basic structure. 
right? So to me, time has to be based upon that practically logical structure. So to me, time just means the fact that some things happen after the other or that some things cause the other, right? So I'm not that deep on this, to be honest. Uh, so I admit that other people pretend to be deeper, but that's my my perspective. I do not think of time as another dimension or as a scarce resource that you can own. Okay, well, but that makes uh, sense. I, I don't want to take up too much time because I know there's probably others. No, take wanna... your time. Go ahead. Just. Well, I, I just wanted to um, uh, just uh, give my, my take on this. Because um, to me, uh, it appears that there is a like a fundamental misunderstanding uh, amongst uh, a lot of Austrian economists regarding what time actually is. Because I, I, uh, I think I've read uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe as well, um, uh, mentioned that time is a factor of production. It's one of the means uh, that's used in the production of uh, goods. Uh, and I think that in Man Economy and State, Murray Rothbard, um, uh, it says something, uh, you know, to this effect that time is, um, I forget the, uh, the, the term that he used. I, I believe he says that time is a nonspecific uh, uh, factor of production. To me, it just appears that while time is something that goes into production, it's not that time is a means that's separate from other uh, uh, goods that we use in the uh, uh, production of any good. It's just that we have certain time units of goods, which we use in, in the uh, production of any good, which is unavoidable. I mean, we, we only have, if you look at the totality of a person's life, that's say 70 years, that's uh, however you want to divide that up in terms of time, that's 70 year units of that person's life. Um, or, you know, if, if a college kid was doing his homework and that took two hours and it, it, it required certain resources, primarily his own body, uh, then we can say that that pr production process takes two body units or, or pardon me, two um, hour body units um, in order to complete that process. So um, I, I think that this is an important uh, thing for people who are using the practical logical method to be clear on. Uh, and I know I'm not articulating this the best way, but I think that the uh, conception of time and what it means when we, when we talk about time, is something that we need to be very clear on in order to um, avoid a lot of these misunderstandings and misconceptions uh, and confusions, you know, as, as we just go about praxeology. Um. I can't disagree. I actually uh, agree that more work needs to be done on clarifying these concepts. And like, so Austrians and other economists will use interchangeable, somewhat interchangeable terms and concepts like, like you said, factor or asset or good. Um, and I do think that so when you say time is a factor, yeah, it's not clear what that means. Like, so they, they lump together factors of production, things that are scarce, things that you have to, to assemble to make your final product happen according to the way that you want it to happen productively, right? Um, and so that could be a certain amount of – so you could say it's a certain amount of time because you envision that, okay, this would take me 2.5 years to do. So you could say that time is a factor, and we also have to have tin and tungsten and labor and resources and energy and time and uh, or whatever. But to me, it's just like a verbal description from the entrepreneur's point of view of how he envisions accomplishing his task doesn't mean that it's scientifically <coughs> excuse me or economically accurate as an outside description of what he did 
to accomplish his goals. I mean, basically, from praxeology, you 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 manipulate scarce resources. You you employ your means to achieve your ends. Like we know that is true, because that's the structure of human action. But does that mean that time is one of the the means, really? Uh, just because we say that there's a difference between what we call superabundant and merely abundant or less abundant resources, right? A categorical difference. Like, so for example, information is called superabundant because anyone who gets the information or a pattern or a recipe or knowledge about how to use a certain factor, that information can be used forever. In a way, it's superabundant, right? Um, compared to the use of a resource like a location on the earth, like a factory, or the amount of tin or lead or or gold or or oil or whatever resource we're talking about, right? Um, those are scarce by physical nature and by subjective human appraisement, right? And so we have to distinguish. Uh, all these things, um, and when we lump them together because we notice a commonality, like okay, as an entrepreneur, as a fact, as an investor, as an employer, um, I have to take into account the scarcity of time and the uncertainty of the future, and I have to take into account uh, my supply of tin and lead and uh, meat or whatever, whatever, whatever it is, uh, and my and my factory. Um, you you do all these things practically to make to to to, to yield an achievement, right? To to yield an end. But just because an entrepreneur does that and has to do that to have a successful result, doesn't mean that. Time is a scarce resource just because, you know, he has to do it now rather than later. I mean, if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? You got to do it at some point in time. So this concept of time factors in, and it factors into interest rates and the conception that we have as living human beings. Like we have, we have, we have parents, we have grandparents, we have ancestors, we have children. We have grandchildren, we have future progeny that we all think about that formats the way we live our lives. That's fine. Time formats our thinking process. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say about this for a second. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I hold a similar view. Thanks, thanks again, Stuff. You're welcome. Thank you for talking. Anyone else? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, actually, it's not mine. Um, I have it here in the chat, so I just read it. Um, what do you think about risk in relation to viruses? Would you agree with Mike Humer's argument that a significant risk of contagion is enough to qualify as aggression? Mm. So I guess this is the danger of saying ask anything, right? Um, look, there's lots of things that are hard for lots of us to know. Um, I have my own opinions, and I'll, I'll spill them out in a second. Um, look, if you read Robert Nozick, um, his entire argument for the state is based upon this idea of risk. Like at a certain point, um, if you don't join the uh, the dominant crowd, you pose too much of a risk, and we can force you to join our club. Um, and then the state arises from that. Excuse me. The minimal state, to be sure, but the state. Um, now, to me, humor is like a modern… Um, he's a modern iteration of this idea. Um, 
he's got libertarian and anarchist sensibilities, but he has an empiricist utilitarian uh, unprincipled mindset, I would say. Um, so I like him personally. I like some of what he's written. He's smart, but I'm not a fan of his kind of 60s go-go approach. Like, um, um, I mean, at least Nozick did it a certain way. Um, so humor, I, I have lots of issues with uh, the uh, the consequentialist utilitarian – like explicitly anti-principled approach of some of these uh, these types like humor, um, like like for example, I've talked to him and I've read his stuff. And are you against intellectual property? I don't know. I have no opinion. I mean, how can you write a book like this and speak out and pretend to have some knowledge and have no opinion about? Patent and copyright law. It can't just be a matter of like, well, we'll figure it out someday. It's it's like saying, uh, okay, well, Jewish extermination, concentration camps, dropping nuclear bombs over Japan. Yeah, you can debate every one of those things. Okay, well, you can debate anything. Or how about shadow slavery? How about black slavery in the U.S.? Well, I, well. Okay, maybe blacks were inferior. Maybe who's going to pick the cotton? I mean you can come up with any kind of argument for these kind of things. So at a certain point, I think you need to figure out what your principles are. And my principles as a libertarian and as an Austrian are individual rights, property rights, first use principle, that kind of thing. You know, You can have lots of edge cases, gray areas, difficult issues. I don't doubt that, but that doesn't mean that everything is up to this utilitarian gravelly analysis where we just sort of like never, never, ever, ever settle on any principled view of anything at all. Like I don't know. Maybe A killed B. Maybe maybe A had a right to kill B, or maybe he had a reason to kill B. You never know. There's a billion… Uh, you know, things that could come into play. So I don't know. I probably got distracted by your question, but go ahead. Well, okay, thanks. Hello, Stefan. Hello. Uh, nice to talk with you again. How have you been? All is good. Who's this? It's Nate the Voluntarist. Uh, oh. I interviewed you back in January. All right, that sounds that sounds right. <laughs> Sorry for not recognizing your voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all good. It's all good. So um, I do have a question uh, in regards to uh, quite a bit of uh, <laughs> several arguments that I've had with both libertarians and anarchists uh, in regards to the left-right paradigm, which uh, I believe that uh, any libertarian, if they have connected any of the dots, uh, should reject in its entirety. Um, I've always uh, argued that uh, uh, libertarianism is neither left nor right, and the left the left and right are two wings of the same bird of prey, and the libertarians should uh, get off of that paradigm and run away from that bird of prey as fast as they can before it eats, basically eats uh, you alive. Um, uh, do you think that um, it is a huge misconception to uh, frame libertarianism as either left or right? Hmm. Well, what do you think? I think so. <laughs> well, I mean, I've been a libertarian for 30 
years. And what attracted me to it from the beginning was this uh, orthogonal breaking out of the left-right spectrum boundaries, right? The uh, the conventional wisdom that like, oh, you're left or right. I think the left-right thing is total total BS. And um, yeah, so I think that libertarians who insist on framing everything in well everything everyone else insists on framing it in left to right terms and libertarians shouldn't go along with that i mean our whole our whole purpose is to say that the left to right spectrum is not the right way to look at politics and interpersonal relationships right mm -hmm. um I mean, the Nolan chart and the uh, these two these 2D attempts to sort of break out of the left-right spectrum in the 70s or 80s, whenever they came about, they were trying to say that we're not the spectrum is not correct. And in fact, I think that the spectrum um, um, helps both sides of the mainstream, like because they can. They can stick to their sides, you know, the left and the right, and they can try to say that they're distinct from each other. But our whole mo as libertarians is to say that, dude, I if I'm talking to a conservative, I am way more conservative than you are in terms of say economic rights, and if I talk to a, a, a lefty. I am way more liberal than you are in terms of liberal values, civil liberties, things like that. So you can – as a libertarian, you can outdo either one of these. Now, why is that? It's not because – I mean you couldn't put us on a left-right spectrum. How can you be more left than a lefty and more right than a righty unless it, the circle closes back on itself, in which case it's not linear and you know? So yeah. I reject the whole spectrum. I think it's mostly nonsense. Um, I mean, you could come up with two, three, four, five, seven dimensions of ways that you want to categorize people, and they might all be conceptually uh, legitimate. But it wouldn't just be left and right. That's just two of the of the dozen. Um, for the libertarian, the main spectrum that matters is aggression versus non-aggression, respect for private property rights in an institutional way versus versus uh, lack of respect. Um, and so, uh, you could you could map these things onto each other in multi-dimensional analyses, um, and that's interesting. It's not always tactically useful because left and right people want to see the world in their terms right um anyway that's my rambling thoughts well, well uh thanks uh thanks for uh, uh taking my what do question. you think i mean you could talk too i mean i'm not the only you could what do you think nate oh yeah um well i've always uh framed libertarianism as uh just respect for self-ownership property rights non-aggression and to tie it all in together as freedom of association um of course um i often get into of course uh, i uh, usually when i um define it that way i i often you know run into those um who say they are libertarians, and then once I once I shared the, that definition to them, you know, they often reveal themselves as status in some sort of way, um, and a, a few a few a few people that I've run into have uh, um, basically admitted that they're not really for individual uh, individualism or individual rights uh, if i'm if i'm framing it correctly that is um 
but uh, I've always, uh, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I've always viewed uh, libertarianism as the, as uh, the right of, uh, bleh, of the right of the individual above all, essentially. And I think, uh, and um, I've read your article on Mises called "What Is a Libertarian," and uh, that that was pretty much what my grasp on the whole thing was uh, in regards to um, how you uh, define libertarianism or how you advocate it. Um, because uh, whenever I'm, because whenever I uh, am talking about libertarianism in general, uh, I kind of take inspiration from, uh, say, Eric July, Larkin Rose, or Blood of the Brave. Um, uh, you know who Blood of the Brave is? No, I know the others, but not that one. Uh, he's a he's a he's another ANCAP. He's a hip hop rapper, so I've interviewed him as well. Um, you know, when I'm when I'm talking like those three, I just I uh, just keep it real and not try to muddle down the whole concept of libertarianism to try to try to appeal to others or uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Eric July mentioned this several times. So what what is it called again? It's not it's not virtue signaling. It's counter signaling. There we go. So I don't try to counter signal. I don't try to muddle stuff down. I just advocate it for what it really is. Um, and I and I seem to see quite an epidemic of it uh, within libertarian circles whether it's anarchist or not. I hear you. I hear you. Um, well, so today's, uh, this is an experiment to see how it would go. And uh, if people are interested, I might do this on a repeated basis. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you guys have any opinions, I'm open to them. Well, this is think, great, actually. It's great to get to talk to you up to now. I really only, you know, read your work or heard you uh, speak uh, when you're interviewed um, uh, on various podcasts. But I actually, I, I would love um, if you were to make this a regular thing. That would be wonderful. I may do that. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah, I would I would love to have uh, a lot of conversations with you because I always learn something new whenever I read your your columns and uh, watch your interviews. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, do you think uh, midday or do you think nighttime? What, what do you think is the best time to do something like this? Probably midday U.S. Yeah. time. Um, I think this time is good since other European people, it might be late for European people, but it's kind of late for U.S. people. So maybe even a little earlier, like um, 10 or 11 a.m. U.S. time so that it's… You know, I early. think this was a good time. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think this was a good time too. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, well I'm going to let it go… a couple hours earlier like you said. All right. Wouldn't be I'll think about it. Uh, Maybe fun. We all need to get out and talk. And next time, everyone else can chat. And I'll try to figure out the Zoom thing and get everyone to uh, collaborate more. Appreciate it. Uh, hi, Stefan. Can you hear me? I, I do. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for this talk. Uh, I wanted to comment about uh, Zoom. Uh, so. Uh, I suggest you try Jitsi. It's uh, an open source and more secure alternative to Zoom, which is proprietary and it's not very good. So you might want to look into that. Why don't you send me a, a link and I'll take a look. Uh, I sent a link uh, in the reply to your tweet where you announced the stream. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And there is also a question if you care to answer. Sure. Uh, so, uh, in the beginning of the talk, 
uh, you somebody asked you about uh, moral obligations towards children, whether parents have this obligation. Uh, so I wondered what you think of uh, antinatalism. Uh, so it's essentially a position that it's immoral to create life because uh, you doom a person to suffer mm -hmm. inevitably. Um, and uh, it's uh, yeah. most uh, commonly uh, argued by uh, David Beneter. He is an analytical philosopher. Maybe you know of him. I mean, so I have never, I've never heard that view. Although I'm not surprised that it exists. Uh, anti, anti, ben, what is it? Anti benetalism. It's anti natalism. Anti natalism. Um. I wonder if it's anti natalism. Anti natalism. Yes. Maybe I'm not ah. too clear. Clear. Ah. Yeah. Um. I mean. The problem with that view is that um, every action that we humans take, and from so from my point of view, every action that we take can have unforeseen consequences, right? And can cause things to happen. Um, and if you strictly link your actions to causes to responsibility, then everything you do, you're responsible for. Which is the strict liability view, which I actually disagree with in the law, right? Um, like if you own a dog and the dog runs a mile and bites someone on the arm, oh, is your you own the dog, so you're responsible for what the dog does. Um, now, in a sense, I agree with an aspect of this philosophy in that I do believe that if you create a child which some of us do as parents and the child is a dependent being initially and has needs um yeah so i i think that the parents have an ob a positive obligation to take care of the child now i guess you could argue that because the world is uncertain and the future is uncertain you can never guarantee that you could even do that even if you live alone in the prairie and you have three children and you have you know a farm you never know maybe there a plague would come and uh, or marauders would come and you couldn't take care of your children um i don't i i just i'm not persuaded by that view i don't think that there's anything metaphysically wrong with creating a life in the world that sparks a new life because that's no different than saying that you take an action that causes something to happen. Um, things change because of your actions. Um, so in the end, I think you can only take responsibility for a certain small locus of actions around your direct action, which is legally what the idea of proximate cause is about like what do you approximately like proximate means closeness or distance or like like what do you cause to happen um so if steve jobs creates the iphone and 17 years later some child dies because you know a mother was distracted checking her her cell phone messages on her iPhone while driving um, and ran over a child or whatever. Yeah, you could say that's what we call a cause in fact, like with or, or a but for cause, like without Steve Jobs creating the iPhone, this wouldn't have happened. Although you can't really even say that because maybe someone else would have created it. But I think that's too far. I just, I, I think that at a certain point, we all live among each other in society, and living in general has risks because we live among people that have free will, and they can choose to do whatever they want, and their their behavior is therefore unpredictable, and the future is also uncertain and unpredictable. So everything that every human ever does, every actor ever does always has a risk of 
affecting the future, harming other people. So that that mere risk can't be enough to say that we shouldn't act because it would just mean that we have to all commit suicide, which to me is like pointless and unrealistic and fights the proposition in the first place because – if our lives don't matter, why do the lives of our future progeny that we might endanger matter? You know, like the whole thing is a risk game. So I guess I'm not persuaded by this, although I haven't heard of this particular sect. Uh, Thank you for your reply. Uh, sure. Though I'd say that uh, it uh, doesn't essentially argue uh, about uh, – uh, consequences of your actions, as you said. Uh, the view that uh, Benatar takes, for example, is uh, about a symmetry between play, uh, pain and pleasure, uh, in which he essentially argues that uh, the state of non-existence is uh, always better because mm. the absence of pain uh, is good, even if good is not enjoyed by anyone, and uh, the absence of pleasure is not bad unless there is somebody for whom this absence is the deprivation. And on the other hand, the presence of uh, pain is bad. And if you create life, uh, you necessarily expose uh, whoever you create to uh, the possibility of pain. Well, uh, so it's uh, like a comparison between two states, the state yeah. of non-existence and existence. And uh, you always choose uh, not to create people. I mean, it's not, it's, not get... it's not about killing yourself. It's about not creating new life. Uh, yeah, but it, in a way it is because – yeah, so I, I mean one of my personal uh, – I mean I'm not a religious believer, um, and one of my arguments was always that the idea that, um, okay, there's a god who creates every, these beings, and they have no choice but to just be thrust into existence, and some of them will choose to be evil. And be condemned to hell and eternal punishment, like according to the Christian or the standard, you know, uh, theology. Um, but to me, that always seemed, well, number one, disproportionate. Like, even if you're Hitler and you kill so many people, at a certain point, if you have an infinite universe to work your sins out, okay, you finally pay your debts. I don't know. Right, so like the idea of eternal punishment never made sense to me. Um, so, but but the idea that you could create a being that had to choose whether to be good or bad. Now, the Christians will say, "Oh, well, you have a choice. You have a chance. You're given. You're given a helping hand. Whatever." But the point is. For the guy that chose the worst life of all, right, to be a murderer, to be a bad father, uh, to go to hell at the end of his life, and to, he would have been better off never having been created. So how could a good god create a guy like that? Like what's the point? So my argument initially as a, as a, as a smart-ass 19-year-old was – Oh well, that means that everyone that you think is bad is really a a, a robot, like that's a god robot. Like, like God never creates really bad people. Like all the people you think are bad are just robots God made that give us a fake choice. But then if you figure that out, then you're in danger of the God mafia. I mean, the whole thing makes no sense. I mean, it, it devolves into you could maybe make a movie out of it or something, but. Um, so I kind of sense the feeling of this idea. I just I, – I don't think that having a baby in today's real world is a horrific crime like it would be to create a new soul who is doomed to hell forever because you know it because you're omnipotent. Like we're not actually God. Like God should know better. He does know better. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He makes a soul that he knows is doomed to hell forever. And to me, that's in a way 
I could see an argument that that's unforgivable. Um, but but that doesn't apply to our actions as non-gods because we're not gods, right? All so, we can do is estimate the future. No, go ahead. So Sorry. You think that uh, a religious argument is more strong here? I get it. But uh, so you compare us to God that uh, he knows for certain about uh, hell and so on. But we also know that uh, if we create life, uh, the person necessarily will die and will suffer from it. And uh, his uh, friends and relatives will suffer from the loss. At least, at least we know that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something like that. I mean, like in, in a sense, as far as we know, all life comes into being at a certain point and expires at a certain point. And uh, the if there's a conscious uh, uh, life form behind that that type of life, like humans, then they will experience a consciousness and they will experience certain um, uh, pleasures and pains, if you want to simplify it. And um, uh, that's that's inevitable. I mean, it's it's it's. I don't see how that could be avoidable, uh, an avoidable part of, of what it means to, to be alive if you're conscious. So any conscious being will always have a finite lifespan and will experience certain good things and bad things. And some will be better or worse than others by certain um, human metrics. Um, and so that's just an, an, essential, an essential part of life. So if you're opposed to any suffering, let's say, or creating a new being that has suffering, then you're opposed to life per se. And again, uh, ultimately that leads to nihilism or some kind of um, – what, like the vehemt movement. The, what is uh, – my friend Nina Paley is part of this the voluntary human extinction movement or something like just yeah it exists but uh, i don't argue on the same ground since them they are some radical environmental yeah. group so right. the reasoning is quite different from right. the academic philosophy interesting i don't i don't know much about it I, all i know is what i just said <laughs> to be honest well thanks for that anyway thank you could i just say something very quickly uh, regarding this Sure. Um, now, I don't presume to be an expert on uh, anti-natalism or what you know, the, the basic argument is. From, from what I understand, it's the idea that um, it's unethical to bring uh, a human life into existence for whatever reason. And it just seems to me that the problem with that argument uh, is one that has to do with the philosophy of human language uh, more than it has to do with metaphysics. Because... Um, in order for something to be unjust to a being, it would have to have been done to that being. But the problem is that a being does not exist before they're brought into existence. So before I was born, I didn't actually exist. So uh, my coming into existence was not something that was done to me by my parents because you know I didn't exist for them uh, to do anything to me before I was born. So it's only after somebody is born that I think you can talk about even justices or injustices. So the actual act of creating uh, a being cannot be just or unjust. It has to be treated as an amoral action is what I think. I mean, a lot of know. You know, philosophers, a lot of philosophers have, um, uh, especially I think Wittgenstein, have uh, attacked metaphysics as basically being uh, nonsense, which just arises uh, out of um, the imprecise and careless use of language. And so I think it's, it's something that needs to be taken seriously. And this is why I you know, initially brought up the, uh, um, uh, the concept of time, because I'm becoming more and more sensitive as I uh, think more about um, not just praxeology in Austrian economics, but also you know, libertarianism and the uh, foundational ideas um, of, uh, of morality. And I, I have a, a keen interest in argumentation ethics as well. And I think that a lot of the uh, problems 
that seem to be um, irresolvable, uh, I think we can make quite a bit of progress if we see these as problems arising from our use of language um, rather than problems as such. So that's just my two cents. Interesting. Anyone else? Because uh, I think if not, I'll, uh, I'll end this shortly and uh, think about the best way to maybe repeat this or restart this uh, in a few days or next week or something like that. But I welcome any uh, feedback or comments on what might be a good idea to do this. Could Seth, you are you able to see the, the chat box, the chat window, where people are see. typing up comments? I see it now. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. But I wasn't looking at it during the thing. Yeah. If I'm going to ask uh, one more question. Sure. Um, if you had the opportunity, and uh, this is actually something uh, that I'm probably going to do in the coming uh, week, week, week or weeks. If you had the opportunity to talk to a decision maker, whether it's a political decision maker or other decision maker, about uh, libertarianism and Austrian economics. Uh, somebody who has absolutely no idea of what this is and you had maybe an hour or two hours to give a presentation to him about mm. libertarianism and Austrian economics uh, for the purposes of decision making. I mean, this is somebody maybe let's say who's, who's actually controlling the lives of others. But what would you, where would you start and how would you structure it? I know that that's, that could be a bit complicated. I need to think about it myself, but we, would you have any, any starting points on your in the way you think. Well, I, and I'm open to anyone else's views, but I'll tell you quickly. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, I'm not persuaded that like so. I think there's there's an entrenched state which you can call the deep state, right? It's not the po the politicians are not always the ones that are the ones that matter. The state will persist. Um, in most countries, there's a government, even if there's no government. You know what I mean? There's a state, even if the government fails. Um, so there's a bureaucracy. There's a, a, a permanent class of workers that maintain the state. Um, I tend to think that the current politicians, like the congressman, the president, these guys are just figureheads that are temporary. They come in and, in and out. So I'm not sure. Who am I talking to? Am I talking to these guys or am I talking to the guys that are in the deep state? I think the guys in the deep state don't care because they want to maintain their power and their and their and their and their and their, their salary, basically, to be honest. Um, if I talk to an opinion maker, so called, like a Donald Trump or a a congressman, I mean as a libertarian, I would choose the things that either are the highest value or the ones that I thought could have the most effect. Now, for me personally, I would focus on patent and copyright because I think that they are the two intellectual property basically. Even though everyone knows, oh, Kinsella's all up on this. It's not – I'm not up on this because I happen to know about it. It's the other way around. I mean, it really is one of the most dangerous things. I mean, yeah, I could talk to Rand Paul about the drug war, but he pretty much already knows, right? I could talk to Donald Trump. Okay, you should legalize marijuana. And if you legalize marijuana, you probably will win the next election. But if you don't, you're going to lose to zombie Joe Biden. Um, so there are simple issues, right? Um, to me, it's it's really all about intellectual property, but I'm under no illusions that we can make these intellectual arguments to enough of the populace to make a difference. But ultimately, I do think that like, okay, so we have the drug war, we have public education, we have – real war, we have the military, we have welfare, we have the central bank, the Federal Reserve. All these things are so entrenched 
it's so despairing to think of how you can talk these people out of it who have an, an interest in maintaining it, right? Because they're basically employed by it or supported by it. Um, so it's difficult. I mean, you can't talk a public teacher out of supporting public schools, government teacher. You know, you can't talk a, you know, and so the same thing is true. But so for me, it would be let's just scale back patent and copyright law and let innovation work its magic and help the free market overcome the obstacles that you guys are putting on us and your other laws taxes regulations whatever so to me it would be patent and copyright to give a a, a predictable Kinsella answer <laughs> sorry okay thank you very much i was thinking more about going on the lines of of monetary policy because that's something that i understand better so i guess i guess we always go uh, go and talk about what we understand i guess that's the conclusion and 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 i i think that the, the think central, that the, banking, uh, central banking is is one of the biggest problems because it helps the state finance its activities right um and it causes inflation and it it dominates the entire the entire culture and i think there's a great essay which any of you if you haven't read it um uh it's 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 by uh oh who's the uh he's one of our austrian fellow travelers uh uh, the literature guy who wrote the the uh, it's about oh, Thomas Cantor. yeah Paul Cantor Paul Cantor and Thomas Mann and inflation Hi, Thomas Mann and hyperinflation um, and not just that some of the stuff by Guido Holzman but it's it's about how this inflation mentality corrupts our entire culture um, it sounds like a throwaway thing but I think it really does have a big influence on how the entire society acts and reacts and why we save and we don't save and why in a, in a, in a COVID thing like we have right now, everyone is unprepared for like, no one has two weeks, four weeks, three months of savings because everyone's living hand to mouth because of inflation. So hyperinflation or inflation like we have now, I think has a significant impact on society so in a way i would say yeah you know if i could reform one thing it might be this federal reserve i don't know it's hard to say patent law federal reserve public education income tax war the drug war they're all so horrible it's hard to say which one tactically you should reform first if you had that you know that wizard wand choice I was thinking more on the lines of, of, of playing their own game in the sense, giving them the, the sort of points that they would like to win in a popularity contest and then trying to find points in, in, in that, in that way. Mm. Well, I mean, I think most of us would be persuaded to do anything that would have any positive effect. <laughs> I think it's it's all pretty hopeless to be honest, not to be pessimistic. <laughs> anyway, all right guys, I'm going to I'm going to go now, but uh we'll do this again soon if uh if it makes sense. Thanks everybody. Thanks for doing the stuff. Thank you guys.